taking our Bible reading tonight out of the Gospel of Matthew. Gospel of Matthew chapter 6. I'm going to read just a few verses of Scripture beginning in verse 9. Chapter 6, verse 9, the Gospel of Matthew. After this manner, therefore, pray ye. These are the words of Christ. This is Jesus talking to his disciples, actually talking to more than his disciples. This was in the midst of the Sermon on the Mount. There were a lot of people there. And he speaks to us today by these same words. Therefore, I lost my place now. After this manner, therefore, pray ye. Our Father which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done in earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. And that's our Bible reading tonight. I want to focus on verse 10 before we launch into our introduction here. And I'll take our text out of verse 10, a part of verse 10 where he says, Thy will be done in earth as it is in heaven. Brother Bob, sir, if you're willing, if you're able, would you please stand and pray for the service tonight? Lord, we want to thank you tonight for the service and all those in attendance to the service, Lord. I would like to ask that you bless this service, Lord, and the messenger. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Amen, amen. And I apologize, I told you you didn't have a job tonight, and then I asked you to pray for the service, so my mistake, we'll have John pray afterwards. Thy will be done. That's what I want to preach to everybody for a while on tonight. This came to mind yesterday or perhaps the day before in the midst of my prayers or meditations or whatever it was I was doing at, the, at that moment. Thy will be done. Thy will be done. It's something that we say a lot as believers. And chapter 6 of Matthew's gospel presents us with what is commonly called the Lord's Prayer, Right? It's been stitched into so many pillows and wall hangings and there have been so many graphics made out of this and it's become, it's become merchandise to a large extent and it's been memorized by multitudes of believers over the last 2,000 years. They're, they're taught it very early in many churches and it's a good prayer to memorize but in the midst of our memorizing of it, many recite it in the same vain repetitions that our Lord himself condemns in this same chapter and others use it like a magic spell some incantation uh, to to summon when they're facing a situation that's uh, uncertain or spooky uh, our father who art in heaven hallowed be thy name thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven give us this day our daily bread you know that whole thing and then they follow that up with a few hail marys or whatever it is you know a lot of believers are taught to just use it or rather misuse it as though it has some sort of magical power or magical properties. We were talking about this a few weeks ago, weren't we, when we had that special Bible study on uh, what the Word of God is and what the Word of God isn't with teachings out of Psalm 91, right? Because what happened? Uh, an alleged, keep it unpolitical, yes, yes. A pandemic hits, and suddenly believers are coming out of the woodwork saying, pray Psalm 91 over your family every day, as though the psalm has some kind of magical power to just go poof and make the coronavirus run away. And no, I'm not doing like that one preacher in that video did with uh, Corona Be Gone. <laughs> this isn't a circus, and we're not putting on a show. We're not going to make a mockery of the Word of God. Not that that was their intention, but come on now. The Word of God has power, yes, but where does the power abide within the Word of God? The power that's in the Word of God is the power to change the way that you and I think. Amen? It's the power to change the way we think. It is the power to incite belief and revive it or, or actually instill belief and faith within us because the Bible even says as much. It says that hearing or faith cometh by hearing and hearing by the word of God, okay? 
So likewise, whether it's Psalm 91 or whether it's the Lord's Prayer or whether it's Psalm 23, the Lord is my shepherd or, or whatever your favorite portion of scripture is that you like to read or, or recite in your mind or meditate on, it's good to do these things, but remember that the power in it, it's, it's, it's not the kind of power that turns lead into gold. And it's not the kind of power that drives off demons, okay? If anything does that, the power is in God. He says it right here. For thine is the power and the glory forever in the kingdom forever. Amen. It's faith that makes it happen. It's not just the vain reciting of words off of a page. Likewise, our prayers. And so while many, some or many may make ill use of the Lord's Prayer, we find in this prayer both a model for the prayers we offer from our hearts and we find a very specific guide for our own way of thinking. Now, I don't want to turn tonight's message into a Bible study on the Lord's Prayer, but I want to focus on the very first thing that Jesus says right after, you could call it the introduction and the praise part of his prayer, which was our Father who art in heaven. You could call that an invocation. You could call that an introduction or an address because it says who he's praying to. Not that God doesn't know. You don't have to start all of your prayers with that, but it's a good way to start your prayers. Father in heaven, our Father which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. That's his acknowledgement on the holiness and the perfection and the eternal marvelousness, if you will, of God. And then immediately after he clears that, not that it was just something to be cleared, he says this, Thy will be done in earth as it is in heaven. And that's the part that grabbed me. Thy will be done. What do we mean when we say that? And that's something that I say a lot. I pray that part a lot. Just that one phrase, I pray it a lot. Thy will be done. Thy will be done. Most often, I'm praying it from right behind this microphone. As, uh, as Brother Bob or someone else is praying for the service. And it's not just something we do as a routine. We really want God's blessing and favor on this, amen? We really do. We don't just, not some midweek thing. Oh, well, the Simpsons aren't on tonight. I don't know if they are or not, I'm just saying. But, oh, well, my favorite TV show or my Netflix lapsed and I haven't got it started up yet, so I got nothing better to do. It's Thursday, so I guess I'll go to church and maybe just do my thing. It's more than that, and we want it to always be something more than that in our hearts, in our lives, in our practice for God and what we do. But we pray that, and I pray that, thy will be done. Well, what do you mean? When I'm praying it up here, I want God's will to be done in the service. And, and, and that's not just in the service and the singing and the praying and, and then the preaching, but his will done in all of it and in every single one of us. I'm getting ahead of myself, man. so let me backpedal a little bit, okay? We'll get more to that later, as the Lord wills. In this prayer, we find a model and guidance for our own way of thinking. And what is prayer? But the communication of our thoughts and our hopes to God, amen? Or else why bother? What is prayer? Except communion with him. And it's supposed to be a two-way street, isn't it? It's supposed to be. It's supposed to be we talk to him and we listen for him to answer us. And perhaps he does it with a voice that you can almost hear with your ears. And he speaks to the heart, and perhaps he answers in his word when you're reading, especially if you're, if you're a believer who likes to, to pray and read kind of at the same time. That's a good thing to do. It is. You can pray with the word, you can pray without the word. It doesn't matter, as long as you're praying in sincerity and not with the vain repetitions and trying to make a show like so many did, did in Jesus' time and many do today, to this day. It's not just the sound waves of our prayers bouncing off the eardrums of the Almighty, so to speak, that pleases him. That's not really what it's all about. And that's part of what was in Jesus' teaching concerning prayer in this chapter of Matthew in his Sermon on the Mount. Or else we could just 
my goodness, we could just record a bunch of prayers and then just, you know, put it on an infinite loop on our computers and let it spew out prayers through speakers. And that would please God just fine. We wouldn't ever actually have to seek his face, seek his will, seek his presence for ourselves because we got all these things we're praying for us. It's not just the noise in the air. Amen. It is the communion of the heart and the mind of a believer with Almighty God. It's that longing, it's that yearning within us to connect with our Maker and spend time with Him and be in His presence. And to do that many times, not all the time, but many times you have to shove off the distractions of the world, shut, turn off the stupid phone, the iPhone, the smartphone, the tablet, the computer, the, the gizmos and, the, and the, the whatever you want to call them. I'm trying to come up with other words to describe all these pieces of techno junk that we are so in love with in the 21st century. Turn them all off. Throw that TV out the window while you're at it too. <clears throat> just saying, just an idea. Silence the racket of the world to listen for his voice. And that's why a lot of Christians never hear the voice of God. Did you know that? It's why they pray. That's why all of their prayers are always one-sided. Just as a quick aside. It's, it always feels like they're just throwing requests up to heaven to slap them up against the ceiling of heaven there and hope that they stick. And then maybe God will come around and peel one off and look at it and then answer it, you know, and grant the petition. But they never hear an answer from Almighty God because there's too much racket and noise in their lives. I mean, really, how spiritual can you be when you're watching the Avengers for the 96th time? Or whatever, you know, pick a popular movie of your choice and put that in there too, doesn't matter. Not that I'm just picking on that either. Same thing with books, a lot of the books that people read. You know, how spiritual can you be when all you ever read is murder mysteries? I'm not picking on murder mysteries. I'm just saying. How healthy can your body be if all you ever eat is double stacks from Wendy's? Little nasty overcooked things anyway. Just saying, take that to heart, meditate on that. Change your diet up. Feed your mind and your heart something spiritual, amen? Let me tell you one of the things, as another quick aside, to that aside, before we get back to what we're preaching on tonight, let me tell you one of the things that this, uh, this, uh, situation that our country is in, that the state of Wyoming is in, the city of Cheyenne is in, one of the things that it's doing is it's been forcing me to kind of reevaluate how we're doing some of the things that we're doing. Now relax, we're not stopping church. Amen. That is not happening, Doc. So what happens if they make it illegal? Oh, well, we've got biblical precedent for that sort of thing. We've got 2,000 years of church history to inform our actions if something like that happens. But in the meantime, all right, and I don't think it's necessarily going in that direction, okay? But maybe we can do more than just the meeting for services. Not that that's just something, okay? It's so important. We have three services a week plus a Bible study, and we tossed it out last weekend about maybe having another Bible study if it pleased people enough and they'd want to come to that. And a lot of that depends on our appetite to learn about the Word of God and all of that. But maybe there's some things that we can continue to do online even after all of this is over with. Maybe there's some video content that we can produce as a church. And I wonder how many believers, faithful believers that are a part of this congregation would welcome the opportunity to maybe sit in front of a webcam or to sit in front of a, of a, of a camera and record their testimony, how you came to know the Lord, what he brought you out of and how he changed your life. I wonder if anybody here would like that opportunity. Praise God, somebody wasn't afraid to raise a hand. Hallelujah. Two people, praise God. Well, relax, there's, there's not that many here in the house of God with us because of what's going on. But I'm just thinking of that. I was thinking of that. Maybe some other things as well. Maybe some additional teachings that we just teach via video or something like that. Now, don't take that though and say, oh, I'll just catch that and you'll never see me in church. Come on now, you know that's a trick of the devil. Amen. All right, enough of that. In this prayer, our Lord says, thy will be done. 
Thy will be done. And so I want to take a look at that phrase and exactly what does it mean when we say that? When we pray either the Lord's Prayer or we're praying our own prayers and we're just saying to, to God from the bottom of our hearts, God, whatever you want done in this situation, thy will be done. Thy will and not mine. And that was Jesus' prayer again over in Gethsemane. You see, he had to eat his own words. Not that that was a bad thing, but he didn't just teach it to us here in Matthew 6 and then not live it when it came to the moment of his ultimate crisis there in the Garden of Gethsemane. He said, thy will, not mine, be done. Thy will, not mine, be done. When spoken from the heart, this phrase, this statement, thy will be done, is a surrender. It's an expression of surrender to the authority and the wisdom of Almighty God. And so looking at it tonight, what does he say here? He says, thy will be done in earth as it is in heaven. Well, rest assured, God's will is done in heaven. It is done in heaven. Can I talk to you for, about heaven for a little bit? Can I talk to you about heaven for just, a, for just a, a few minutes or a couple of minutes tonight before we go on to the next thing? In heaven is the will of God. That's one reason why it's called heaven. That's one reason why it is heaven. The Bible says that heaven is his throne while the earth is his footstool. He reigns. God reigns in heaven. He rules in heaven. I don't like to use the word rule because that makes it sound like a tyranny. Reigning uh, has a different tone to it. R-E-I-G. And thank you. Couldn't remember if there was an H in there or not. I don't do spelling very well a lot of times out of the top of my head when you're trying to recite it. Don't look to me for any advice on spelling bees. But he reigns in heaven. He has all authority. He has all authority everywhere. And he reigns everywhere. Yes, yes, yes. But in heaven is where his will really gets done. And let me tell you, brother, it gets done in heaven. Amen? There the angels obey. He reigns in heaven in perfect power. He reigns in perfect wisdom. He reigns with perfect efficiency and in perfect order. Did you know that God is a God of order today? Amen. It's like, oh, don't tell me that. I'm a cluttered person. I don't want to hear about how God is a God of order. I got no order in my life at all except what's absolutely necessary to crawl out of bed in the morning, find some clothes that aren't too wrinkled or aren't dirty, get in them, drive off to work, do my job, come home, tear it all down, do it all again. No order. God is a God of order. Just kind of slip this in there. It's good to have order in your life, amen? amen? You'd be amazed what you can get done when your life is in order, when your house is in order, when your finances are in order, when your mind and your thinking are in order, when everything is in order, when your refrigerator is in order, when your sock drawer is in order. <laughs> it's like, are you one of those? Well, kind of. But trust me, once it's done, it's done. I'm not the kind that's always redoing it. I save that for furniture. I'm always rearranging furniture. It drives my poor wife crazy. Pray for her. Pray for me. Perfect order in heaven. And it's not like the kind of order that's filled with tyranny. It's not that. It's not tyrannical order. It's the, it's the, it's the kind of order that where, wherein things work in perfect harmony. The angels hear and they obey. And I imagine that they obey enthusiastically, right? And relax, I'm not, I'm not putting ultra heavy emphasis on that O word. That is such a four letter word. Even to many modern Christians, they hate to hear that word obey. But the reason they hate it is because they don't obey. They do not like to obey the word of God. They like to kick back against it and make excuses for it and find reasons to take it out and not let it actually inform their life and the way that they live. But in heaven, there is perfect order. God's will is done in heaven. And there are no mistakes in heaven. There are no dropped balls, no neglected responsibilities. Things don't get half done in heaven. Oh, hey, uh, angel, whatever your name is, let's just make up a name. Jeff, all right, why not? You know, hey, angel Jeff, did you get this done? Ah, uh, well, you know, I started it, but then I got kind of bored. I really didn't enjoy it. I don't really enjoy it, God. God. You know, maybe you can, can you put me on some of the kind of duty? I'd really like just, you know, pushing a broom for a while. Uh, you, you understand, we're just kind of making this up as we go. 
to make a point. I don't think they have brooms in heaven, but you get what we're, what we're talking about. He doesn't have angels that are like that. Not that we have any reason to believe. The angels hear and they execute, man. They're on it. They're Johnny on the spot. He says, go, and they go, and they go enthusiastically, and they're swift, and they're thorough. Things are not half done. Responsibilities are not neglected. Things are not poorly done. In heaven, there is completion and there is continuance and there is diligence and there is accomplishment and there is efficiency in heaven and no doubt, here's the, here's the good part right here, right? Because you can have all of those under tyranny, but in heaven there is, I have no doubt, satisfaction in the work that is done, whatever that work may be. And we don't really know we don't really know what it is that the, or even how many, you know, we don't know what it is the angels are constantly engaged in and involved with. We know from the Bible that they are ministering spirits, but much beyond that, we don't really know. They are messengers, and that's what the word angel means even, is messenger. They deliver messages, but I'm sure that there's more than that, that they're engaged in, that they're involved with. Whatever it is, it gets done, and they are satisfied with the results, and God is satisfied with the results of the work that is accomplished. He does not have to deal with, I even wrote this in here, he does not have to deal with cranky angels, slackers, shammers, and rebels. And I thought about making a joke about unions, but I don't want to offend anybody. And there are some hardworking union men. There really are. Yes. My grandfather was a union man. He was. And he almost died because of it. He had lead poisoning. They couldn't figure it out. This was way back in the 30s that it happened. It went down. Got a detailed history all about it from my dad a little while back. It's something I'd known a long time ago, but not the details of it. And so God doesn't have that. He doesn't have cranky, cranky people and, and slackers and shammers up there in the kingdom and rebels. He reigns, no doubt, like a boss, but a good one. Amen. He's the kind of one. He's the kind of God you want to work for. The kind of boss that you want his praise and you want his approval. And he never requires anything of you that is unreasonable or impossible because with God, nothing is impossible. That's a fact, man, that is a fact. And so we say, thy will be done. Thy will be done. But we, the way he said it here was, thy will be done in earth as it is in heaven. Uh-oh. Well, we just shown a whole new kind of light on that now, didn't we? All of a sudden, it's not just a throwaway phrase that we just let fly in the midst of our recitation, our recital of the Lord's Prayer. Oh, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven, as though, as though God's going to do all the work. Because when we say thy will be done in earth, that involves something. Oh, it just got serious. It just got serious. But we're not trying to scare folks. Can I get an amen if anybody agrees with that? Amen. Thy will be done in earth. Thy will be done in earth as it is in heaven. We want his will to be done in the earth. And talk to just about any believer, any real sincere believer, wherever they're at in their walk with God, their relationship with God, their knowledge of God and God's word and his expectations and all of that. Talk to just about any believer about that. Say, hey, would you like to see the will of God accomplished on the earth? And they'd be like, yeah, man, absolutely. I want to see that because what comes to mind immediately is a bunch of laws being passed. Thou shalt not this, and thou shalt not that, and thou shalt not any of these other things. But notice that all of these things that they thou shalt not are all things that they themselves are not doing. But the moment someone who's stricter than them says, oh yeah, thou shalt not this either, but this other guy's doing it, well then you've got a conflict because then there's a problem. And then the, the more uh, the more liberal one calls the more uh, the more formal or strict one calls him a legalist. And then the more strict and formal one calls the more liberal one uh, watered down, lukewarm, and not even saved. They both get on the, they both jump on the horse of judging one another instead of judging themselves like the Bible says we ought to do. Judge yourself and then bring yourself by the power of God, bring yourself into greater conformity to God's word. 
So when you say you want to see God's will done on the earth, a lot of people are like, yeah, I'm all for it. And they want to see somebody else come in with a gavel and, a, and an elected position and ultimate power and authority to do what they think they want them to do. And I've even found myself straddling that fence about in the midst of this whole thing. All right, straddling that fence between states' rights and federal, uh, you know, fe federal prerogatives and all of that, and find myself wishing that, wishing that President Trump would now relax now. Okay, I'll clarify all of this. Found myself wishing that President Trump would tell all these state governors to, hey, let your churches open back up again. But then I find that at odds with the state's rights side of myself. It's like, wish the Fed would get off our back and just handle things at the state level like, like the Constitution was set up for us to do. Some of you know what I'm talking about. And so I even find myself at odds on that. So what do you do? Well, I step back at that point and say, thy will be done. Thy will be done. Thy will be done. Consider the perfection of heaven and imagine it at work on the earth. That's what we're praying for when we say that. Thy will be done in earth as it is in heaven. The perfection of heaven, its efficiency, its thoroughness, its, excuse me, its accomplishment, all of that operating here in the world. Imagine what that would be like. And don't be afraid of such a state here on the earth because mark my words, brothers, sisters, whoever you may be tuning in on this online, that day is coming. Now, no, it's not going to come by the hand of man, not the way that a lot of people think. Not the way that a lot of misguided believers over the, over the millennia since Christ's return and ascension back to the Father. Not the way that a lot of misguided folks have tried to make it happen. Oh, well, we're just going to break, break away and go establish a utopia somewhere. And they try to set up some man-made theocracy and it turns into a body count or it turns into something horrifically immoral. That sort of thing has happened over and over again. I dare you, study church history sometime. And it, it will really open your eyes to, you know, there are some right ways to do things and there are a whole lot of wrong ways to do things. And those wrong ways can be very, very bad. Why are you mentioning that? I'm not sure. We'll just let that ride and let the Holy Ghost do with it what he will. We want his will to be done on earth. And one day it will be, yes, God will come. He will reign. Jesus will reign. We will reign with him. Hallelujah. But not in the way that we are right now, not in this crude manner. We're going to be made new by that time. Amen? Amen. We will have already tasted of death or been taken up in the rapture and not tasted of death. But we will all, as he said, as Paul said, we will all be changed in, the, in a moment in the twinkling of an eye. Okay, so he talks about all of that. But all of that will come to pass. But in the meantime, we're still praying for it now. Thy will be done in earth as it is in heaven. Well, what does it take to realize God's will being done in earth as it is in heaven? Well, it may take some work on our part. Now, don't misunderstand me. I am not trying to not trying to preach kingdom theology here, that it is the responsibility of mankind to usher in the kingdom of God. It is not. It was never our responsibility to usher in the kingdom of God. The kingdom of God is in you already, Jesus said. The kingdom of God is in you. So, well, what's our job then? What are we supposed to be doing? I mean, whatever you want to call it, the work of God, kingdom work, something like that. I'm not throwing off on that term there's some merit to it okay what is it that we should be doing first we should be living upright and godly in this world that is our first responsibility as Christians is to actually live a godly life and a holy life really and there's different names for that but whatever it, it's, it's what the Bible teaches. It's what the whole New Testament teaches us. And a fair amount of the Old Testament as well. Part of that Q&A Bible study that we had on Tuesday night had to, brother, we answered that question from last month about uh, when God cursed or when God, uh, when he, he didn't actually curse them, but he told them that if they did not obey, there would be a curse upon them. And it was going to be on everything in their lives. But before all of that, he pronounced and promised a blessing on everything in their lives. If they obeyed the word of God, brought themselves into, into alignment with the will of God and let it be done in their own lives, it'd be a blessing on everything. 
A blessing on all they had, a blessing on all they were, a blessing on their offspring, a blessing on their possessions, a blessing on their coming and going. It was like everything, everything, everything in their life would be blessed. It's the responsibility of the believer to live upright. It takes wisdom and willingness to recognize. Let me slow it down for a minute. Can I do this? It takes wisdom and willingness to recognize something that is wrong, okay? I'm not talking about something's wrong with your car. I mean, something, something wrong that someone is doing or that you yourself are doing or that another person is doing, uh, a coworker or a family member or, or a spouse or whatever. It takes willingness to recognize something that is wrong and have no part of that wrong thing. Does that make sense? So well, all the people in our all the people in our in, in our church cheat on our taxes. Well, I'm not saying that about our church. Okay, I'm just kind of pulling this out of thin air. Okay, just as an example. So well, all of us cheat on our taxes. So it must be right. Oh no, it doesn't matter if it's people in a church doing it or people in a company that are doing it or or individuals doing it through their own personal taxes at home. We do things honestly. Amen. As the Bible has called us to honesty. Honesty in business, honesty in life, honesty in dealings with one another, in our relationships, honesty in all things, honesty with God, honesty with ourselves, honesty in absolute. It takes wisdom and willingness to recognize something wrong and have, have no part of it. The Christians resolve to remain morally clean in the midst of corrupt human systems must be absolute. Let me just sit, let that sit there for a second and radiate some truth into our lives, okay? The Christian's resolve to remain morally clean must be absolute. No matter what's going on around us, no matter what's going on close to us, we must be of a mind and of a heart to have nothing to do with wickedness. Well, what if my boss tells me to lie on this form that I've got to turn in? That's when the Christian has a conversation with his boss. Respectful conversation. Hey, um, I know you told me you wanted me to do this, but the thing is, that's a lie. And I, just, I can't do that. I'm not willing to do that. You know, and don't you be the one that makes it an ultimatum. Put the sinner on the hot seat. You're not on the hot seat, they are. They're the ones that are trying to provoke you to evil. And I've been tested on that, so please don't think I'm preaching this on credit, okay? Put them on the hot seat. Do it with respect. Don't be insubordinate about it. I remember working with a man. He was a notary in that construction office. He was a notary in that office and the boss wanted him to falsify the date or something like it uh, because of something he was just trying to get done. It wasn't a matter of fraud, it was just a matter of him wanting to get something accomplished but the boss not being Christ-minded, of course, because not Christian, didn't understand where this brother's position was on that matter and that brother was ready to walk. He was ready to walk off that job if he had to in order to preserve his integrity before the Lord. Blessedly, it didn't come to that. Another man intervened and it kind of, it got talked out and the brother, he was cool. He didn't have to, not that he would have anyway, but he, the boss didn't push the issue to the breaking point. But even if it came to that, be willing. You don't think God's going to bless you in a situation like that? Oh my goodness, it won't cost me my job. Oh, I can't lose my job. Who's your God? God? Or the guy who signed your check? I'd rather have the boss be mad at me than my Heavenly Father mad at me. Amen. Oh man, yes, amen. <laughs> amen. I would rather that. I would. I would. So you've never had to make that choice. I almost did a couple times, and I was willing. I was willing. God sees that kind of dedication. God sees the kind of resolve and that kind of a heart, like the like the resolve that was in those three Hebrew young men: Meshach, uh, uh, Meshach, 
Somebody help me out. I know Abednego, but what was the other guy's name? Shadrach, thank you, I knew it, it's on the tip of my brain. Meshach, Shadrach, Abednego, standing on the outside of that fiery furnace, and Nebuchadnezzar threatening them with a horrible death, and burning is a bad way to go, man. But those men would not be moved. They were resolved, they were steadfast, and they even said, even if God doesn't save us, we're not committing this sin, we're not bowing down to your idol, and so remember that when it comes time to vote. Remember that when it comes time to take, to take a stand against a recalcitrant significant other that wants you to do bad so that they can be pleased with you. Remember that the next time a family member or a close friend puts the heat on you to do something that's ungodly. Remember that resolve. And pray again. Thy will be done. Because rest assured, God's will is that you not sin. Amen. Amen. His will is that you not sin. Don't let it get all foggy and cloudy and muddled up in your mind. That's the trick of the devil. He uses confusion. He does the same thing like he did with Balak and Balaam way back there in the Old Testament. We talked about that guy who finally just gave in because he had some greed in his own heart and he really wanted what he was being offered even though he knew that it was wrong to go that way. Make your heart steadfast. I mean like a flint, man, like a rock, unmovable, a big rock, unmovable. I will not be moved. I will not compromise. I will not do what this system or these people are pressuring me to do. Let it be that way because that's one way that God's will is done in the earth is when it is done in you. And that's what brings us right to the heart of our message today. I'm not preaching about social justice and social reform. When that's the when that's the when that's the, the goal, when that's the ultimate goal, all you ever get. You can make some real changes, sure, you can get some real changes accomplished if you riot loud enough and you threaten hard enough and all of that, and you get enough people backing you up. Sure, you can accomplish a few real changes, but they're all surface changes. None of them address the root problem of all human suffering and all human problems, which is the sin that drives the human race. The sin that drove you to sin back in your sinning days. The sin that drives the ungodly to sin even to this very minute that we're preaching about tonight or that we're preaching tonight. It's that when God's will is done in us. That's when you can see real change happen. And I know I've talked about it before. I've preached about it before. How during the Welsh revivals of what, some 100, 200 years ago or so, the, the effects of that were so deep and so widespread that the judges that tried cases would come into court at the beginning of the week or at the beginning of the day wearing white gloves on their hands because they didn't have any cases to try. What do you think is going to fix this country's problem? Not to go back to last Thursday night, but what do you think is really going to fix our country's problem and our world's problem? Is it, is it going to be more legislation? Going to be greater laws and more sweeping laws on the books? Or is it going to be the deep-rooted change in the human heart that only the blood of Jesus can affect within a man? So why don't you go protest at abortion clinics, Pastor? Because it's a waste of time. I'm not saying there's anything wrong with doing it, but if a person gets saved, they're not gonna go have an abortion. Right? You wanna see the abortion clinics close up? You wanna see bar rooms shutter forever? You wanna see these dens of wickedness and dirty books? I don't even know if they still have that. The internet's probably deep six to the dirty book industry, I don't know. You know, you want to see those kind of websites disappear? You want to see the wickedness of a wicked nation vanish like the fog of the morning? Amen. Bring people to Jesus. Amen. Amen. Because then they'll stop drinking. They'll stop smoking. They'll stop whoring. They'll stop getting abortions. They'll stop, stay out of the politics. They'll stop a lot of things. They'll also, you know what, no, huh? They'll also stop having blind faith in any one particular political party. 
And you'll start having informed faith in God. Amen? You get, if I offended some Republicans there, I do not apologize, okay? I like Republicans, but they got a lot of problems themselves. There's a lot of corruption in that party. It's as much as there is in the Democrats. And a lot of times you find a lot more sincere among the Democrats than you do among the Republicans. A bunch of hypocrites among the Republicans a lot of times. At least a lot of the Democrats will just come out and say what they are and talk about what they're trying to accomplish. That's one respectable thing about them. It's about the only, but at least there's that. Woo! Making some enemies tonight. I hope not, but... We got to be fair and balanced, right? <laughs> Thy will be done in earth. Man, we got to wrap this up. This is going long again. It takes a resolve to do what's right. And we'll leave the rest of that. Just leave the rest of that where it is. We've already talked about that. Let the Lord speak and I'll get out of the way of that. But it has to be done in us first. And brothers and sisters, that's where the rubber meets the road. That is where the rubber of this prayer meets the road in your life. Thy will be done in earth as it is in heaven. If we want to see the will of God done in the earth, we have to be willing to let the will of God be done in us. It's got to be done in us with the putting away of wicked things and wickedness in our own lives. And then beyond that, because it's not just that, right? It's just more to Christianity than just cleaning the sin out of your own life and letting the blood of Christ wash across you and make you a new creature. Because then that's all we would do. That's all we would ever do. It's like, all right, well, I've got nothing to do now. So, you know, let me go sin some more. So I've got some more sin to clean out of my life. And I feel like I'm doing something for God. No, 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 no. That's not what it's all about. Once the sin is out, man, then continue to let God's will be done in your life. Continue. Why don't you pray for the Holy Ghost if you haven't done it yet? Or if it, it seems like you've been distant from him, or maybe you've even grieved his spirit. Touching back on that question from Tuesday night. You know, pray again. Fill me again, Father. Let me feel, let me feel the ex that experience one more time. And then sanctify me. What does that mean? Make me from good. Make me. I'm good today because of Jesus Christ. Now make me better. Make me better. Point out something in my life I need to change. Man, that takes us back to David's prayer, doesn't it? Search me, O oh God, and know my heart. Try me and know my thoughts and see if there be any wicked way in me and lead me in the way everlasting. Man, that's a prayer for every day of the week. You can pray that and mean it and then let God's will be done in your life. And that's what it takes. You have to let it. You have to let him. You have to allow it. So God will get it done no matter what I do. Don't buy that for a second. You can either help him or hinder him. And the Bible even tells us not to, and Paul said, I do not frustrate the grace of God. And he tells us not to grieve the Holy Spirit. Yes. And so all these different things, it's very possible to, uh, to call upon the name of God, at least with our mouths, while still working against him in our lives. Let us never fall into that trap. Brothers, sisters, individuals, okay? I'm not trying to turn this into finger pointing or anything like that. I'll point at the camera because I don't know who's watching, okay? You know, but don't let yourself become that kind of believer. Because if you do, are you even really a believer? When you're fighting God, when you know you're fighting God, that's what I'm talking about, when you know you're fighting God. I'm not talking about if you just find, you find yourself in the wrong state of mind and then, and then, and then God gets your attention and then, and then you pray and you, and you make it right and you change your way of thinking. I'm not talking about that. I mean, when you know that you're fighting God and you're just going to keep on doing it, that is a sucker's road, man. And it will lead to destruction. Let us, let God his will be done in our lives. Let it be done in me. Let it be done in me. But that would mean, yeah, yeah. What you're thinking, it means that. It does. What's bad about that? What's wrong with that? What's bad or wrong about just letting God have his way in your life? If his will is done in heaven, we need to bring this to an end. We're not, we're not going to... We're not going to finish all the points at this point, okay? So let's just go ahead and we're going to wind this down right here and make our way towards the altar service. But as we do so, okay, remember, what is it like in heaven? 
God reigns in heaven and things get done in heaven and they get done well and they get done thoroughly and they get done in order and they get done effectively and there is satisfaction. They get done right. Let me not skip that, please. They get done right and there is satisfaction in its being accomplished. Do you remember the first time you surrendered to the will of God in your life? There was a satisfaction that came after that. There was a satisfaction that came with, I know I have done something that pleased God. But let him have his way. And so how about it tonight? As we prepare for the altar service, as we bow our heads and close our eyes tonight in reverence to God, and nobody looking around, it's just you and Jesus tonight. Are we cooperating with God? Are we working with him? Are we allowing him to make us part of the work of God? Are we, are we even wanting that? Or do we find ourselves praying like so many have? Oh, our Father that art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven, whenever you get around to it, Lord. But I'm not going to help it out. I'm not going to be part of it. I'm just going to sit back and do my thing and try to manage my own stuff while you, while you work your master plan. But don't ask me to do anything. That can't be our attitude tonight. Christians, that cannot be our attitude. We have to let his will be done in us if we will ever see it be done in earth. It requires surrender, yes, but Jesus surrendered, didn't he? In his prayer here in Matthew 6, he surrendered. In Gethsemane, he surrendered. Every day of his life when he sought what pleased the Father, he surrendered. When he hung on that cross, and did not come down of his own strength, he surrendered to the will of Almighty God. Are you surrendering tonight? Again, not casting doubt, but you know if the answer is yes or if it's no. Let God's will be done in you tonight and have the satisfaction that comes with it. Amen. And with that on our hearts and minds tonight, let's kneel down for a little while if we can, here in church or there in your home. Let's seek the Lord in prayer. Let's find a place to pray tonight. Thy will be done in me as it is in heaven. God bless you tonight is our prayer. Let's find a place to pray. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Our Father, which art in heaven, hallowed be your name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done in earth as it is in heaven. And when he says to you, my will be done in earth, will you let it be done in you? Will you let it be done in you right now and today and tomorrow? And will you let my will be done in you next week, next month and next year? Will you let my will be done in you all the days of your life, son, daughter? If you'll let my will be done in you, then my will will be done in earth until the day that my will is accomplished in all the earth as it is in heaven. It's been good to be in the house of God tonight. It's been good to be here tonight. It's been good to have Brother Bob back with us. Good to have all of you with us. And all of you that are tuning in, we appreciate you tuning in in the midst of this. I know we've talked about having a great reunion service the first Sunday of May, but it looks like it's not going to happen the first Sunday of May. But that's okay. 
when we called for prayer for Brother Bob, you answered and you stepped up. And I'm talking to everybody here. I'm talking to everybody through the camera, okay? You answered the prayer. You stepped up. God heard. God answered. He's with us tonight. So let's have a call to prayer for reunion. Let's have a call to prayer for reunion. And not just that the order expires or gets shortened or gets taken out of the way. Not just for that, but that the cause of the order goes away. Because as much as we've sort of mocked and derided what it's all about without mocking it too much, because yes, the disease has been real. It's been a real virus, okay? We'd like to see the whole thing go away, amen? amen. The sickness, the virus that causes it, all of that. The fear and the panic that it's incited. The tyrannical behavior of some, the irrational behavior of others. We'd like to see all of it removed out of the way. And so let's pray for reunion right here for our church, amen? For all churches, but for our church, certainly. Let's pray for that. In fact, we'll do that here in just a moment. But let's not just pray for it tonight as we dismiss. Let's pray for it tomorrow and Saturday and Sunday and Monday. Let's pray for it until the Lord see fit to grant it. Amen? Amen. Can we do that? We can do that together. Let's all stand. And let's dismiss in prayer. Father, in the name of Jesus, you are good. We thank you for your goodness. We thank you for your mercy, your power your wisdom, your grace. We thank you most of all for having control upon all of this, and we trust in that, Father, we do. As much as we may rankle and, and, and chafe at it and, and wish that it were different, Father, we trust your divine wisdom and we trust your divine timing. Nevertheless, Father, we pray for reunion. We pray for healing for those that need it, and we pray for the removal of these things that have brought us to this state. If it please you, and let us be reunited here, a family together in your house under this roof. Father, in your perfect timing, and in the meantime, to be fed as it pleases you online, here in your house, and however we may be together as believers. We ask this in Jesus' name with perfect trust and confidence in you. Amen. Amen. Amen.